Bonjour. If you asked me what my favorite game is, I don't know if I could give you an honest answer. It's Metal Gear 3. But when I think of the games that have made me the happiest over time, I always think of Super Mario 64. It's colorful, the controls are simple yet require practice to master, and the audio design is perfect. It's a game that cemented my love for this stuff forever. As time has passed, video games evolved into more mature, darker storytelling vessels. Hitman 2 Silent Assassin is one of the more mature games that I played over and over in my early teenage years, but it was the third title, Hitman Contracts, that consumed my nighttime hours for months on end after it released in 2004, and for the same reasons as Super Mario 64. I love the aesthetic. The gameplay is simple to understand, but mastering each level takes hours of practice, and the sound design is impeccable, in no small part thanks to Jesper Kidd's incredibly dark, moody score. Contracts, as well as the sadly forgotten masterpiece, Freedom Fighters, solidified my fandom in developer IO Interactive. And after the release of Hitman Blood Money in 2006, I was convinced that these great Danes could do no wrong. Then they announced their next project, Kanan Lynch. Pitched as a very gritty, dysfunctional buddy movie in game format, I followed the title from early on, and I was obsessed with every drop of information that came along over the following months. The screenshots were awesome. The promotional art and trailers were, in typical IO fashion, extremely stylish and appealing. I used to watch the trailers on school computers all the time. It was a foregone conclusion that Kanan Lynch was on its way to be an instant classic. Then, in 2007, the game came out. And, uh, <laughs> well... So we'll talk about the mixed reviews and GameSpot controversy later, I promise. But before anything else, let's talk about the game itself. The story revolves around a man named Adam Marcus, known by his alias Kane. He became a mercenary, eventually joining a group known as the Seven. During a botched operation in Venezuela, 25 civilians were wiped out and Kane was held accountable. During his transit to death row, Kane briefly meets a man named James Seth Lynch, or just Lynch for short. The trip to Death Row is interdicted by a group of mercs, and Kane and Lynch fight their way out of the city. As it turns out, Kane is led back to the Seven, his old group. They believe that Kane stole from them and are going to collect. I thought you were all dead. I should cut you up right here and now. Well, why don't you? Yeah, he crazy. They're going to execute Kane for his betrayal regardless but if he can return the stolen funds, the Seven will spare his wife and daughter. Lynch is assigned as Kane's watchdog, and the Fragile Alliance is born. That's the basic premise, but outside of this rudimentary description, the story of Kane and Lynch is about heartless, 
cruel losers that do nothing but bring misery to themselves and everyone around them. And frankly, this is something I really love about the characters in this universe. Even the most hardened tough guys and gals in video games have some redeemable qualities, or an arc, that permits you to root for them despite their morally grey behaviors. But Kane and Lynch are just plain bastards. The constant catastrophe surrounding them is part of the appeal. The tale is consistently harsh and bleak. The game makes you fully understand that you're playing as vile, low-life bums. But I just couldn't help but to keep playing to see if there was any sort of redemption to be had. Kane, in particular, is a calloused monster, and everything he attempts is a progressively greater calamity. Based on his behavior and dialogue, it can be inferred that he's a self-centered, vindictive brute, yet he's calculating and sharp. When Kane meets a safecracker before a bank heist, their body language and dialogue implies a long and storied friendship. During the heist, when he isn't getting his way, Kane quickly turns violent and nasty towards the safecracker, and another person turns against him. Even the constant pursuit of saving his family can be interpreted as a selfish quest. He's constantly trying to pick up the pieces, until... No, wait! Let me talk to them! <laughs> After his wife is popped in front of him, he snaps and beats one of the seven to death with a shovel while screaming. You son of a Make talk to them! You son of a Make talk to them! He's clearly distraught, but his dialogue indicates that his rage is because he didn't get to do what he wanted to do. And this event only serves to further his self-centered nature. When his daughter is recaptured and taken to Havana, Kane puts his men in extreme danger and doesn't hide the fact that he couldn't care less about them. In one of two endings, Kane shows his true colors by abandoning his men on the island to escape with his daughter, Jenny, and her vascular ass forehead. And the thing is, he's not a fool, he's just willfully ignorant to the suffering of others, even his own daughter, who hates his guts for the pain he's brought their family. You abandoned us! Honey, I'm sorry, I- For 14 years! Until we get dragged from bed, and mom gets shot because of some shit you've done! Gee, that was worth it. And it's not just Kane. Everyone in this game is a reprobate pig. During a level set in a prison, Kane goes to break out former members of the Seven, all having been betrayed by the group previously. Riffic, Tharpa, and Shelly are all just as bitter and cold as Kane, and they make no bones about how much they hate him, only joining his crusade for the money and revenge on the Seven. If you choose the canon ending of the game, Kane goes back into the fray to save his men. Despite your best efforts, Riffic still gets wasted in battle, and Shelly condemns Kane before running off to escape the island alone, leaving Kane and Lynch to fight their way out with a wounded Jenny. As Jenny's life hangs in the balance, Lynch takes a round to the torso, and all Kane can do is whisper to Jenny about the letter he wrote her from prison, again, bringing it back to himself. As I said, the tale is harsh and bleak, there are no happy endings. Then, there's Lynch. Mr. Kane, what? I need you to cover your head. What did you say? Just cover your head now! Lynch is a man on his way to death row for the alleged murder of his wife. It's never confirmed one way or another, but Lynch is a diagnosed schizophrenic that has to take meds to keep things under control, which opens up possibilities about his backstory. Lynch continues to assert that he's an innocent man, but he is shown in-game to be capable of a complete psychotic break. In the bank heist, he's tasked with watching over the hostages. He blacks out and smokes all of them only coming to when he and Kane are in the back of the van trying to escape the city. In a really cool touch, when playing this game in co-op, which for some inexplicable reason was split-screen only, you can see what Lynch sees during his psychotic break, which are the hostages appearing as attacking cops. Can't miss it. Kane, you know I won't work with Lynch. You know Lynch? I know of him. He killed his wife. Did a real nasty job of it too. A second, you killed your wife? 
This isn't the time for talk. Other characters in the world make mention of Lynch as well, and want nothing to do with him. Lynch needs medication to maintain his frail mental stability, but is often running low, adding to his unpredictable nature. But even when he's being himself, Lynch is just as much of an ice-cold criminal as Kane. So, despite promising him a seat at the table, the Seven betray Lynch and plan on burying him next to Kane and his family. Lynch fights back with Kane, and the two agree to get their revenge on the Seven together as a duo. Kane and Lynch are terrible people. There isn't any redemption, and I certainly don't feel uplifted by anything in this story. And as I've mentioned, I kind of like it. It's not terribly deep, the game overall kind of feels rushed, and either ending is really abrupt. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to pass the story off as a masterpiece, it's just that I really enjoy the characters of Kane and Lynch. I love how the team at IO specifically went against having young, handsome models for their leads and instead made them ugly, balding, scarred thugs. And although they're nasty people, the characters are oddly charming and I truly enjoyed their constant bickering and almost non-stop arguing throughout each level. This is around the time when co-op games, bolstered by the tremendous success of Gears of War, were really starting to take shape. Games like Army of Two, released the following year, had you playing as two goofballs that would constantly razz each other and generally act the bollocks. Meanwhile, Kane and Lynch can't stand one another and don't miss a second to remind each other of that. I do wish there had been a sort of archetypical foil to Kane and Lynch's ongoing crusade like a Lieutenant Hannah that could pursue them along the way, but sadly this wasn't to be. Though the story is thin, I do like that there are little moments that give some backstory to a character, like when Lynch is mentioned in the prison, or when Kane defiles Redimoto's corpse. I owed you this for a long time. I paid my debts. Come on, you're the one talking about keeping momentum. This isn't just senseless brutality. If you listen closely, you can gather that Kane is giving the deceased man the same scar that Kane has on his face, implying that he's paid him back in kind. Also, the name Redamoto is a cool little nod to the team that went on to form IO Interactive. And speaking of little visual details. Running on the Glacier engine, which had previously powered all major IO titles, most notably up to that point Hitman Blood Money, Kanan Lynch hasn't aged amazingly well, but it still looks pretty good. And the game does nail the cinematic look that IO was aiming for, obviously heavily inspired by the Michael Mann films Heat and Collateral. With levels like the nightclub, clearly borrowed straight from Collateral, and a battle through the streets of Tokyo, obviously being taken straight from Heat's battle through LA with some overt references to be sure. And some of the environments are still quite lovely, from the dark, smoky nightclub bathed in blue lasers and filled to the hilt with civilians, to the tranquil pagoda nestled amidst the crushing concrete jungle around it, with blushing blues and yellows punctuated by these little red lanterns. Phenomenal. Then we have the construction site with gorgeous pink and orange skies, and the ongoing rainstorm. I also appreciate the hunks of concrete and terracotta that will break off during gunfights. It really adds that visceral edge to combat, and makes the environments feel like a little bit more than texture sheets. It's a shame, then, that the latter part of the game is set in this god-awful, ugly, boring jungle, but we'll get to that in a bit. It's also unfortunate that the Glacier Engine couldn't seem to handle friendly AI very well. They'll go there and do that as you command, sometimes, but then you'll find yourself a mile away, having just blasted your way through two dozen thugs, only to look back and see these dunderheads sitting idle. Come on! I can't wait out here all day! Alright, just coming. Otherwise, the graphics are nothing special, but the Glacier engine is still fairly solid for being so out of date, and I only had one crash to dashboard and no big bugs or glitches in my playthrough. I had mentioned the Michael Mann influence, and this is evident in some of the character designs. 
I remember seeing a photo in a gaming magazine that showed the real guy that Lynch was modeled on, but the design was very clearly taken from Wayne Grow, the scumbag from Heat. Kane is even wearing the gray, double-breasted Yves Saint Laurent suit that Neil Macaulay and Vincent donned. Outside of their designs, another big factor in why these characters are memorable to me is the voice work. Now, do you understand everything I've said? Because if you don't, I'll kill you. Voiced by Brian Bloom, Kane is written as cold, cynical, and explosively violent with little provocation. Brian's performance reflects this damaged man's seething anger and traumatic guilt. He's certainly not here to make any friends. Jerry and Monroe, as Lynch, plays the ruthless hard man with the appropriate amount of thick, coarse gravel without ever becoming too over-the-top or silly. The dialogue isn't anything special, but Jerry's performance is solid and appropriately intense. All characters in the game, namely the two leads, use a tremendous amount of profanity, a point that several critics have made over the years. But talk like this is common in your average high school football locker room, much less amongst hardened criminals that are literally fighting for their lives. I'm not saying it's not excessive, it is. But I also think that was kind of the point. The rest of the cast does a decent, if forgettable job, no disrespect, nothing stands out as bad per se, just nothing as distinctive as the main characters. The weapons are loud and devastating, as they should be. It helps to punch up the shootouts, which is not exactly the game's strong suit. Sadly, the soundtrack, composed mainly by Jesper Kidd, is nothing special. Jesper Kidd composed the soundtracks to the first four Hitman games, which I'm convinced are the greatest tracks ever assembled for a video game franchise. It cannot be overstated how important those soundtracks were to establishing the overall atmosphere and legacy of the Hitman franchise. He also did the amazing soundtrack for Freedom Fighters, which, again, has been forgotten. In Kane and Lynch, however, the music is so unremarkable that I won't even remark on it. T. Thank you, Quacky. No, no, I, I, I might have. But why? Why? So this is kind of the linchpin of Kane and Lynchpin. All the neat character designs and teeth-rattling audio in the world can't make up for a game that isn't fun to play. The game is, more or less, a fairly standard third-person action game with a few stationary vehicle shootouts, a really strange boss fight, some poor stealth, and an odd fixation on repelling. Off the bat, let me just say that the first half of this game is pretty good and shows great potential. The first level is a standard tutorial mission, getting you acquainted with some of the mechanics up front, but there are memorable little moments, like when a cop car comes careening through a garage door. Or the finale where the rogues battle out of a diner and donut shop as police swarm the location. There's something about major battles in quotidian settings that always makes for good gaming fodder. There's a short segment in an abandoned mall after meeting the Seven that shows you how to throw grenades and give Lynch one of your guns, a feature that I literally never used once, so meh. The bank level starts with some lazy stealth and it's kinda cheeks, but you do get to see Kane perform his judo flip to punch dagger combo, which functions well as an occasional one-hit takedown, but it also adds to his mythos as a capable hard man. You also get a look at getting ammo from some of your teammates. They're usually flush with what you need, but occasionally they will tell Kane to get lost and find his own, which I thought was a cool touch. Mechanics are fairly straightforward, you kinda just blast everyone in your way. It's not too complicated. One complaint I have heard before about the game is that there is no reload button. The game will automatically reload your selected weapon after a short period, but there is a reload button. On PC, it was E by default and A on the 360 controller. I 
don't know why anyone had trouble figuring that out, but whatever. One function there is not a key for is taking cover, which is always an automatic action, if it works. The cover mechanic in Kane and Lynch is terrible, and if the game decides to let you have it, oftentimes cover isn't adequate for stopping rounds. Defending your choke point at the bank entrance is a great little battle, showing off the view of a sniper that is acquiring you as his target, as well as the ability to throw back tear gas, which is kinda neat. Another complaint I've heard brought up is the weapon spread. Let me state right now, I know this is a video game, it's not meant to be true to life, and I completely agree that fun is much more important than realism. That said, I'm kinda torn. On one hand, I like that you can't snipe people with a fully automatic submachine gun firing 9mm. It doesn't work like that. And I kind of dug that I had to lay down suppressive fire and close the gap to hose the bad guys down. On the other hand, I was able to snipe some of my opponents with a handgun, and regardless of the caliber, this is pretty unlikely. But overall, I was able to get pretty handy with the mechanics, and with a few exceptions, I never struggled too greatly with combat. One thing that does drag Kane and Lynch's gunplay down to the sewer, however, is the way enemies react to taking rounds. Sometimes you'll pull off a slick headshot and you get that John Wick rush going, but usually they'll take two rounds through the pelvis and one through the femur with nary a wince. They just keep shooting like automatons, and it's corny. This is something that made Resident Evil 4 so good for its day. Popping an opponent in the hand or knee caused them to react, and you knew you could reliably make your next play from there. Not so much in Kane and Lynch, which is a bummer. As I had mentioned, there are a few on-rail segments, and although this battle out of the back of a van starts hot and feels pretty daring and intense, it also brings up another problem I had with this game. A lot of these really cool moments drag on just too long, and this is a prime example. Blasting at pursuing cops with your ragtag buddy in the busy streets is great at first, but it just goes on and on. The same thing happens in the nightclub. Shooting your way out the first time is awesome, and the little flashlights that denote your enemies peppered among the sea of panicked civilians is pretty incredible. Lynch walks along with Redomoto's daughter on his shoulders, and you have to protect them. Cool. Then, she wakes up when you get to the roof, she knees Lynch in the nuts, gets loose, and... You literally just run back to her office, knock her out again, and walk through the exact same club and do the exact same gunfight, this time with just less civilians around. This is artificial lengthening at its finest, and kinda ruins the initial thrill of the level. Same thing happens at the construction site. It's cool to battle against a few waves of mercs side by side with Lynch in the pouring rain, with Jenny crouched down in a freshly dug grave, mourning her mother in complete shock. Then the waves keep coming and coming. And always too soon. Please, you can't stay with me. It's too dangerous. Just run! And just when you think it's done, a gigantic dump truck comes out of nowhere to crush you. I had forgotten all about this, and it had me laughing my balls off when it appeared. It's just so silly. Like, did these guys have training on this machine? Were weapons proving to be too ineffective and someone just grabbed the keys? The technique here is to just blast and blast some more until you get the driver. <sighs> Hilariously, the boys just take advantage of this truck and use it to crash the walls of the prison where they break out the X-7 members. The rioting and chaos of the prison break is appropriately mad, with bodies everywhere and ongoing battles as you gather your team. The ending, with the prisoners breaking down the fence and charging through tear gas, is a pretty cool visual effect and overall the level is decent fun. Redomoto Tower isn't too shabby either. The opening vista atop the building is pretty impressive visually, and rappelling down to the boardroom window to plant explosives is pretty slick. The remainder of the level is basically just plain Jane, pop the bad guy stuff with middling mechanics, but there's nothing outright bad. 
As the fight spills out into the streets of Tokyo, you get to play that heat-inspired scenario that I had mentioned previously. This is a great little segment. If you don't enjoy the shooting mechanics, there's nothing here that's going to change your mind, but I enjoyed it for what it was, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. Overall, up to this point, Kane and Lynch has a fairly strong presentation. The mechanics are passable, if average, and there are a handful of memorable moments over some fairly interesting levels. Overall, up to this point, Kane and Lynch has a pretty strong presentation. The mechanics are passable, if average, and there are a handful of memorable moments over some pretty interesting levels. I remember being extremely disappointed by Kane and Lynch when it came out, but playing up to this point, I was surprised at how much I was enjoying it, and I couldn't figure out why I soured on the game all those years ago. Then you go to Havana, and I was reminded. Carpet Day! So, I've mentioned the flaws and little frustrations in this game that feel somewhat permissible and are masked by the cool level design and fascinating characters. Things I had mentioned like the automatic cover that poorly protects you, awful friendly AI, C-grade shooting mechanics, another lame on-rails segment, and another mechanic that I haven't even mentioned, Revival. Every corny aspect of this game comes together in Havana like a giant Super Bowl made of feces and toenail clippings. This is precisely where Kane and Lynch goes downhill, hard. It's this constant battle of you going down and needing to be revived with a shot of adrenaline. Then your teammate or multiple teammates go down and they need to be rezzed constantly. When you get downed, if the AI is smart enough to get to you, the animation takes so long and is unbearably tedious in the middle of battle. And if you take too many injections, you OD and it's game over anyway. Everything is just a constant cluster and not in the Call of Duty 4 way where it was very orchestrated chaos inside of clever, well-designed levels with impeccable gameplay. Oh no, no, this is just awful. Rumor has it that Havana is made up of mostly unused portions of what could have been Freedom Fighters 2, hence one level literally being named Freedom Fighters, which would explain the sudden radical shift of settings for the last half of this game. Well, that's just lovely, isn't it? Not only does this suck, but it reminds me once again that we still don't have a sequel to that beautiful gem. Anyway, this level is so poorly crafted. A big open area with naval high cover that doesn't protect you, long lanes of fire with weapons that can't hit anything, enemies on turrets, a helicopter that does gun runs on you as you try to advance, and the constant babysitting of your inept, brain-dead comrades that keep getting themselves downed. It's atrocious. Back indoors, I got a little mojo back and started dunking on fools again with a few suave shots. There's a rooftop sequence where you blast a few BTRs and this helicopter. You know what game made fighting vehicles on foot feel threatening and intense? Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter. Everything in Graw had weight and impact. This part in Kane and Lynch, however, feels like shooting spitballs at cardboard. Although, one highlight from this level was me landing the greatest grenade toss in third-person gaming history. I came into my office, I went under my desk, I cried, I cried, I cried like a 10 year old girl! The third section is this bizarre, abysmal, out of nowhere stealth sequence where you need to cap these bums before they can set off a distress flare. This doesn't even count as bare bones stealth. There's no indication as to how well you're hidden or the amount of noise you make nor is there any clue as to your teammates' visibility. These guys can't see five burly gringos in a small poppy field. Oh, nope, nope, now they do. You get a suppressed pistol, which I figured would be viable as most video games make these things completely silent, but nope, ugh. Then there's this segment, 
where you lead one of your chums, Carlos, through a linear path as he carries a giant mine. It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. Sniping bodies in a rain-soaked jungle. Bad idea. Leading your man by stopping every 10 meters to press the three key. This is like leading a dog around without the charm and the pet pets. The second on-rail segment is where you're glued to this turret on the back of a Jeep. It's basically just the van battle in reverse. It's lame, boring, and frustrating. I can't spin around to see these guys. Guess I'm dead. I already discussed the two endings of the game, but to recap, they both suck. Now, Mr. Bubble and Squeak, you may enlighten me. Alright, so when Kane and Lynch released, the game got fairly middling reviews. The general consensus was nearly universal, but one review in particular had a controversial aftermath. Jeff Gerstman, editor at GameSpot.com, gave the game a 6 out of 10, and regardless of whether or not you like his style, the content of his review was completely fair. However, shortly thereafter, Gerstman was fired, and due to California state law, as well as a convenient policy by GameSpot's then-parent company CNET, details surrounding the firing were not provided. At the time, GameSpot's entire page had been decorated with Kane and Lynch banners, as well as an entire Kane and Lynch theme across the whole site. This led to speculation that Jeff had been fired due to pressure from IDOS Interactive, the publisher that paid for the website banners and theme. GameSpot initially denied this, but surprise surprise, it turns out years later that after his NDA expired, Gerstmann confirmed that this was indeed the case. Upper management bent over for a big pump from the marketing sausage and took bread off a man's table after 10 years of service. Jeff Gerstmann landed on his feet and co-founded GiantBomb.com with Ryan Davis, another former GameSpot editor that walked out in solidarity with Gerstmann, a fine show of loyalty. Though I wouldn't be surprised, I don't know if reviews are outright bought and paid for as some have speculated over the years. However, the whole Kane and Lynch fiasco showed beyond doubt that journalistic integrity is oftentimes nowhere near as important as marketing dollars. Publishers and shareholders demand a game to come out by a certain time frame. They carefully curate the pre-release footage that the public gets to see, and they let journalists and influencers play very specific snippets of gameplay so that they may then hype the game from their platforms. The devs know their game isn't fully finished, but they're in a hard spot. They don't want to sabotage their career and tank their own game that they've poured their lives into before it even releases, but they know what's coming. These companies are not stupid, and their marketing team is filled with people whose entire job it is to make these turds as shiny and desirable as possible. Then when the game launches and gets lambasted, damage control begins immediately. The game gets patched to a finished product three years after the fact, the company releases a cutesy little anime along with new content that they charge you for, they use a famous actor to play one of the characters to make it appealing, and then they gaslight the shit out of you to make you think this broken mess was awesome all along. Then the fanboy mob comes out in service to their corporate overlords to quell anyone exposing this expensive shell game for what it is. And that's the problem. It's not the devs, it's not the shareholders, it's not lawyers, it's not Trump, Biden, or Edward Teach on Queen Anne's fucking revenge. It's us, the gullible fools that lack the strength of will to close our wallets and say, no, do better. <laughs> this is over years and you just, you just... <laughs> I 
I don't care what anyone says. I love Kane and Lynch too. Now, now, before you start clacking away that I'm simping for a mid game or whatever cool term you learned this week, at least hear me out, okay? If you're one of the many, many people that don't like this sequel, that's fantastic. And I understand. Whether we agree or disagree, we're both entitled to our opinions, and I don't begrudge you for yours. I'm not even here to change your mind. I just want to tell you why I think this game is undersung. The story picks up four years after the end of the first game. Lynch is shown peacefully resting in his apartment with his girlfriend, Sue. Lynch is hired to run guns to Africa and calls upon his old friend Kane to help with the operation in exchange for a cut of the money. Right off the bat, you'll notice that Kane is still cold and splenetic. Lynch offers Kane a friendly handshake and within a second realizes he's not getting one in return. He asks how Kane's daughter's doing, gets a curt response, and the subject is dropped. Lynch's genuine attempt to reconnect with Kane is cut down and it's back to business. Before they can go to Kane's hotel, Lynch needs to shake down a local punk, Brady. Just a stern talking to. Upon kicking in the door, gunfire erupts and from this point on, Kane and Lynch 2 never lets up. Ever. After catching up with Brady, the three exchange rounds, one of which catches and kills Brady's girlfriend. Realizing this, Brady commits a pharyngeal seppuku, leaving Kane and Lynch to walk away. These two men have been reunited for less than 10 minutes and they've already failed and made a complete disaster of something. So look, I won't go through an entire rundown of every story beat, but as it turns out, the girl was the daughter of a high ranking CCP official, Shang Si, and now there is a very large target on the titular duo. Lynch is determined to protect his girlfriend who, as a result of his poor decision making, is now in mortal danger. Kane just wants to finish this arms deal with Glazer, the scummy British expat heading up the gun run. But really, this is basically just the entire plot of Dog Days summed up. These two men are constantly on the run from everyone, fighting their way through legions of gangsters, street cops, SWAT, Glazer's mercs, and Shang Si's private security. Now, of course, I would have loved more depth to this plot, more character development, an arc for either protagonist something, anything, but no, this is all you get. At its core, one of the tenets of Kane and Lynch 2 is that it's a commentary on video games of its era that constantly portrayed violence as sexy, fun, and consequenceless. With that in mind, the stripped down story in this game is all it needed to be. Two criminal losers constantly making massive mistakes where the result is extreme violence. Everyone in this game is a terrible person and deserves all the bad things that happen to them. The only exception is Sue, whose only mistake was being the loving companion to a guy like Lynch. And of course, she meets the worst fate possible, though I'd rather you play the game to find that out the hard way. It's bitter, nihilistic, and highly unpleasant. Though, that's the point. This is not a pretty game. Whether you like the basic storyline or not, it's secondary to the visual presentation. We'll tear your soul apart. This is what will likely make or break your experience with Kane and Lynch 2. There doesn't seem to be many moderate opinions on this. You either love the visuals or you despise them. Dog Days is a unique take on the well-worn third-person perspective, where the game is presented as though it's being filmed by another person running along behind you, recording the events with a crummy handheld camera. This is how the team at IO researched for the project as well. A few members of the art team flew out to Shanghai with a poor quality camera and filmed all sorts of reference material. As a result, Kane and Lynch 2, stylistically speaking, really is one of a kind in gaming. Pixels are broken when you take damage, 
droplets of blood spurt onto the lens, and the screen is usually filled with temporal light artifacts and other nasty effects. There's even a mosaic blur censoring nudity or extreme violence, such as pressing a man's face into a scalding stovetop. Maybe he shouldn't have been standing there. Somehow this makes the violence seem even worse, as it allows your mind to fill in the gruesome details. Even the loading screen between levels is presented like a video that you found online, with a buffering circle in place of a traditional loading bar. Checkpoints in the game are presented like timestamps in a video. It's very clever. The cinematography during cutscenes is presented as such. As characters chat or sit in silence, it appears as though someone is filming everything, panning the camera left to right up and down. And as soon as the action hits, which is never far off, the quote-unquote cameraman rolls into action with the characters. The whole game has this live leak rotten feel to it. It's not horrifying because there's a big Jason Voorhees type guy in a mask with a machete chasing you, and it's not a big dragon breathing fire or the main character punching a boulder inside a volcano. It feels real, and this is an actual place in the world, so... I really enjoy all the little details packed into each area, and although the entire game is essentially one long corridor with nothing but shootouts, the world does feel very organic and lived in. The level architecture and map design is oppressively brutal. Nearly every corridor is tight and grody, with concrete jutting overhead or pressing at you from either side, blaring neon lights from market districts selling all sorts of cheap junk through to the tiny little apartments that people are stuffed into like tuna, with their precious personal artifacts filling up even more of the limited space. You're constantly being passively squeezed inward by everything. There's always an ongoing or residual storm. Metal poking out at you, bicycles, furniture, and garbage. The claustrophobic intensity of this game's design is suffocating. It just never feels like you can catch your breath. The brief moments where you're outside in relative silence still sees the player in some unfinished construction site, train yard, or warehouse. Fighting through the seedy underbelly of Shanghai makes Carcer City look tame in comparison. I also like the fact that you're not some six foot five chiseled super duper army man fighting against elite operatives with high tech gear. You are once again playing as complete schlubs, fighting against other complete schlubs, wearing mismatched golf shorts and ill-fitting polos, wielding flimsy machine pistols through sweatshops and fish markets. Again, I'm not trying to convince you that Kane and Lynch 2 is some misunderstood masterpiece, but I am saying, with sincerity, that I truly revere and admire the overpowering art direction that this game went with. It's unique in the truest sense of the word. I will say, by default, the game enables shaky cam to give the player a true feeling like a man is chasing behind you with a handheld camera. This feature is uh, poetically neat, but it made me nauseous, and I never get sick with movies or games. I mean, I used to play Game Boy in the car, but this is just way too much. I disabled this effect as quickly as I could, and the relief was instant. Anyway, bottom line is, the art direction the team was shooting for is absolutely not for everyone. It's not even for most people, which is part of its appeal. IO could have played it safe and made it more commercially appealing to as broad of an audience as they could, but they didn't. Someone had a vision, and they saw it through. Sound design in Kanan Lynch 2 is incredible. There really should be no debate there. The audio team really, really crushed it with this game. Starting with the soundtrack. It's not cool, pulsing synth, heavy metal, or EDM. 
It's the soundtrack that will play on the elevator to hell. See you there. German vocalist and composer Mona Muir composed the soundtrack, and she did a phenomenal job with this soundscape. Warped voices cry out in agony, strings are being strained, heavy machinery clangs over the deep rumble. IO wasn't trying to make you feel cool when playing this game. You are trapped in this abyss with awful people and constantly soaked in filth. Mona is one of the originators in this industrial sort of anti-music scene, and her skills were put to great use here. In addition to the industrial horror stuff from Ms. Murr, German musical composition group Dynamedian crafted an entirely original score with 20 plus songs created to sound like they came right from the local area. Songs range from catchy, upbeat C-pop playing in storefronts to more traditional sounding Asian music wafting inside of sweatshops and the lighthearted lounge tunes that play through car speakers or over various menus. Oh, just don't let them hurt me! <laughs> Each with the general. <laughs> Please, Lynch, make them stop! Which way, uh, you your seat. No! Leave her alone! I said leave her alone! Tell him to stop! Please! The peaceful, jazzy tunes playing behind some seriously gruesome sounds of torture is mind-bending. In addition to the music, voice work in Kanan Lynch 2 is amazing. It really bums me out that it became kinda trendy to hate this game as the really good stuff like the voice acting gets disregarded. Brian Bloom returns as Kane, and some of the characters' moments throughout this sequel are incredibly intense. Thankfully, Brian is a professional, and seriously came out swinging to help sell these harsh sequences. People complain that the characters just run around yelling, you missed a lot of the nuance in his performance. People that complain that the characters just run around yelling missed a lot of the nuance in this performance. There's plenty of shouting and cursing and mayhem, of course, but there are the little moments, too. Hey. Do you, uh, want to talk? No! Like when the duo have just endured an extremely grisly encounter with a box cutter, and Kane asks, very softly and sincerely, if Lynch wants to talk about it. Another standout performance is for the role of Glazer, the crime boss. This guy is a pure creep, oozing that Euro trash charm without an ounce of sympathy or compassion. That's me! We're in a, in a situation! I need a pickup! Yeah, yeah! It might need the latch as well! I don't fucking care if your mum's got fucking head cancer! Well, you just get here! Interestingly, Glazer is portrayed by Jason Connery. Yes, the son of Sean, as in James Bond. I thought I had misread that when I looked at the credits, but nope, that's the son of James Bond. And the guy nails his role. All the foul characteristics mentioned above are perfectly conveyed via his performance. Well done, Junior! But the standout performance is Jerry and Monroe as Lynch. The character was a decently written, if somewhat generic, tough guy in the first game. In Dog Days, Lynch starts out relatively the same. A no-nonsense gangster guy working the criminal beat, but as the plot progresses, the character begins to split apart under extreme duress, and Jerry and Monroe's performance puts over the smothering hellscape that Lynch is breaking under. Who are you trying to kid, Lynch? Who are you trying to kid? Headline sound crap. If you listen carefully, Lynch will often mutter somewhat incoherently to himself as the situation is erupting around him and after surviving the box cutter scene and running to a safe place, 
His mind basically frays, and the old psychopath that the first game advertised him as comes pouring out. <laughs> <laughs> Lynch. I don't know much about the guy personally, but Jerry and Monroe is a phenomenal actor, and his portrayal of Lynch in Dog Days is genuinely entertaining the whole way through. In general, like the first game, I absolutely love the regular banter between these two men. I can't do this anymore. That's not fair. Yeah, it's fair. Whatever you touch turns to shit. We'll discuss this later. They're constantly arguing and making callouts during battle, and it's a great dynamic. One last note about audio in Dog Days. The weapon sound effects are strong. Every gunfight is a sonic assault on your senses. The visuals, as mentioned before, are constantly in your face, while the screaming echo of each gunshot is there to box you on your ears. And because most encounters are in very close spaces, everything is amplified that much more. By the time you reach Shang Tsi's office complex and wail away with a light machine gun amongst the cubicles, you hit a sort of maximum sensory tolerance. The sound is deafening, and this makes the quiet moments equally as overwhelming, as you're waiting for another burst of machine gun fire to come ripping at you at any moment. I could go on, but in summary, sound design in Dog Days is immaculate. I saved the best for last, or the worst, I guess it depends on who you ask. The weapon spread is as erratic as the first game, but like the first game, I never really had any trouble with it most of the time. It's not amazing, but I can't sit here and disingenuously say the mechanics are bad if I didn't think that they were. And there are improvements from the first game. For one, there's a dedicated cover button, which brings the gameplay to at least 2007 standards. Secondly, they got rid of the awful res mechanic with the adrenaline. When you get down, you just get back up. It's obviously unrealistic, but it speeds up the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay significantly. Additionally, they completely removed the stupid friendly AI teammates. No more pointless commands, no more babysitting. It might not sound like much, but playing Dog Days immediately after Dead Men, stuff like this really sticks out. Plus, the game has split-screen and online co-op, which is always appreciated. I also really like how difficult the game is. The pace of the combat reminds me a lot of Modern Warfare 2, the uh, good one. The main complaint about the gameplay is that there's absolutely zero variety, and, well, yeah, that's fair. The enemies don't really progress or do anything differently. There are no boss fights against giant dump trucks, you don't repel. Nothing. The only differing segment is when the boys are shooting out of a door on a helicopter where you pepper dudes in a building and briefly fight another chopper. So, I'm going to make this point one last time, I swear. I'm not out to convince you that this is a good game, but again, I enjoyed the combat of Kane and Lynch too. Is it literally just a whack-a-mole where you run from room to room shooting at opponents? Yes, it is. But so what? Did you want an arbitrary stealth section? A driving section? A fight on a train? A fight underwater? Did we need to climb up a big wall where pre-scripted bricks fall out and a character says, whoa, close call? 
Did you want to hunt collectible trinkets to unlock concept art? I think that the game ends right when it starts to wear out its welcome. It took me about four hours. And yes, I remember the meme. <laughs> and right to that point, I was having just enough of the constant blasting. Does that make the game good? Nope. And actually, the fact that this game was $60 upon release is ridiculous, even with the multiplayer component. Oh, then I guess I should mention that. Both Kane and Lynch games had a unique multiplayer suite that kind of resembles but predated games like Among Us and Dread Hunger. I played it a little bit back in the day, but I remember very little of it, and it's essentially dead outside of a small fan community, and this video is already going on long enough, so I mean who cares. I rented the game for free from my job at the time, and honestly I would have been pissed if I paid full price, so I completely understand how upset someone would have been back at launch when they beat the game in under 5 hours. But looking at it artistically, the game was exactly as long as it needed to be, and there were no jungle levels cannibalized from other games, so there's that. All in all, the first Kane and Lynch, Unalive Men, is a game brimming with potential, style, and a touch of grit but it absolutely feels like a half-baked, Frankenstein Freedom Fighter sequel with a helping of Michael Mann's sensibilities. If it had worked out, this could have been another classic from IO Interactive. Despite the rough edges, I mostly enjoyed the first half of the game, and again, I like that the story is about a group of heartless losers. Look, I'm a sap for a good old happy ending, but these characters are oddly endearing in their repulsiveness. The second half of the game in Havana is rubbish, and for me, it kind of completely spoiled the experience. I looked forward to this game for so long, and I was so disappointed in the end. The game lacks vision, it lacks focus. It's gritty, but it still feels clean and very Hollywood. Ultimately, I feel Kane and Lynch was lost in the shuffle of an amazing era of video games because of its lackluster gunplay and that it didn't fully commit to its own bold identity. Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days, on the other hand, doubled down into its own unique persona so hard that it divided people. The gameplay I would describe as decent, there's no real variety, and it's very short. So if people dislike the game because it lacks substance, yeah, I get it, and you're right. But the combination of its grim art direction, unique sound design, and crushing atmosphere is something that stuck with me over the years. I played this twice back in 2010, and not again until this review, but it really hasn't lost its sting in the past 14 years. Whether it's objectively good or not is debatable, but the game is nothing if not memorable. Although I do remember enjoying it, I played Uncharted 4 around 6 or 7 years ago, and I can't remember anything about it. Kane and Lynch 1 sold approximately 2 million copies, with the second game roughly pulling in over a million, so it's not that the series was a total flop, but with the lukewarm critical reception and with games becoming more and more expensive to make, it's not likely the series will ever return. Not to mention, I don't think you'll be seeing the setting from Dog Days anytime soon. And it's a shame, games like this are becoming more and more obsolete. IO Interactive split with publisher Square Enix in 2017, becoming an independent studio. Thankfully, they retained the rights to the Hitman franchise, and the World of Assassination trilogy, much to my delight, is amazing. But they lost the rights to Kane and Lynch, and I would bet that Square Enix will likely store the rights in a shoebox somewhere for the rest of time. IO did retain the rights to Freedom Fighters, however, so when you're done jerking around with James Bond or whatever, could you please develop a sequel to that already? Thank you. Oh, one last thing. I've heard many people over the years complain about the abrupt ending to Kanan Lynch 2, where the duo commandeer a jet leaving the mysterious cameraman to his fate on the tarmac. 
To this day, the final image we have of Kane and Lynch are of them being terrible people. How fitting. Players wanted answers. They wanted resolution. But I guess we don't always get our way, do we?